Going at this knowing that you're going to antagonize everybody that maybe wants to be antagonized by it. And there's a lot of art police rules that, that go along with that. Honestly, I was really excited to get dissent and to and critique because it's really a visceral reaction to what you believe should or shouldn't happen. I have got Hello. a very, very special treat for everybody right now. Um, as everybody knows, I'm the founder of Woodbury House. Um, we are dedicated to the Richard Hamilton movement. We've been a part of it since 2014. And very recently, uh, the New York Times, who's been famous, calling Hamilton the godfather street art, and I really do believe he is the godfather, has spoke about him again. Part of the reason is number one, there's a lot of activity, a lot of excitement, there's a lot of positive things which are happening. But more importantly, very recently, uh, an unknown artist has been dubbing up the streets of not just New York, but all across America, and there's a bit of a goal behind it. And the man who is a mystery in front of me is that very artist. So thank you very much for your time, sir. You're welcome. Glad to be, uh, it's an honor to be on here. I really like your podcasts. So oh, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Um, it's good to see you. It's good to see Nemo and Al and, and Mike Mubon and, and uh, Ken Moss up here and to hear everybody's little uh, add their pieces to this, uh, this big puzzle Richard's uh, spread out for us. So. Yeah, for sure. Um, look, for legal reasons, obviously we're not going to re reveal who you are, but first and foremost, uh, I know you're an artist anyway, um, how can you've been gravitated towards the Richard Hamilton market? Why is it so important to you? Uh, Richard's first conceptual exhibition, which was the Mass Murder series. And uh, when I had learned about uh, Richard through meeting Andy a long time ago, um, I just thought that was the, uh, that was the coolest thing. You know, to do that in the 70s, the late 70s, and to really antagonize and force the public to deal with the, the police chalk outlines. And since no one had really the language to, to deal with that, I, I, I love the idea of, of someone waking up and going outside and, and being presented with something they believe to be true and having to to deal with that um and uh that's a really honest uh interesting way of you know entering a, an art experience is not knowing it was going to be there and so and to see that as the kind of um base psychology of of someone of something i would do myself and i really really thought that was kind of a hero move for um for richard really just that's just way ahead of its time. And I, we see that now as kind of a common experience where uh, we see artists wanting to produce a non-gallery experience, a non-setup, like a, an actual going from a vacuum, not knowing something's gonna happen to the experience of seeing an art experience. And uh, you see a lot of people attracted to, to Richard's work kind of because of the, the setup, the the surprise, the the plan of of bringing that to someone's life without telling them, without giving them the surprise, and and not asking for anybody's permission, not asking for New York's permission, or you know any city that he did the mass murder stuff in, you know, which was a really avant garde, you know, funded government funded program from from uh from Canada, you know, that's that's. It's amazing. And I, that was the kind of foundation for wanting to, to do that, not just the Shadow Man, but, um, but to produce that, to, to bring that language back to, this, to, this, to the streets again. And, yeah. you know, a lot of people have opinions on whether that should happen or not. I, I love that too, but the language is really effective. And, and, you know, I'm not trying to own the language. It's, it's, it's Richard's language. But to continue it and, and to, to see more of them on the streets, to, to, to fashion the, 
the experience based on today's culture is is fascinating and it's unexpected and that's you know that's what i love about the the aspect was you know you, you don't ask for permission to do something as 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 large as this and for it to be an homage to that language and the psychology behind it and the antagonistic and the and the the gift of giving um that kind of language back uh it's very subversive and everybody who's kind of seen it and been involved feels that subversion of of not putting sp spray paint so to speak but splashing these kind of effective visual haikus that allow people to to feel what they feel because i think you're at a base dna you know what a shadow means you know that that language is uh, is in you uh as a kid all the way up to an adult so that's um you can see them from space and that's a uh, they're quite beautiful and the experience of doing them is 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 beautiful and seeing a city you know at its quietest and producing these this language again is is super fun we um we being a key of key advisor to the richard hamilton foundation which obviously andy's a part of we've had um yeah. a lot of people hit us up the, the the moment that people started seeing the shadow figures reappear in uh, in america and there and um, and we've had mixed reviews Percy, from my standpoint, and Percy from Woodbury House's standpoint, is a great thing because we're resurrecting a bodies of works that we're not claiming that you, the individual, um, are, are trying to say these are genuine Hamiltons, but we're retelling the story because there are there are so many people in the art scene, collectors, investors, people that have started their own galleries who don't know enough about Hamilton. And this is stirring the pot again and bringing out these stories, so much so that the New York Times, the great New York Times, has not only written about it in their conventional way, in the paper online, but also on their social media channels. And bearing in mind, they've got over 16 million followers on there, on Instagram alone, which is massive. So I think you've done a really, really good job there. Um, so I've had people say to me, well... This is clearly not Hamilton. And I said, well, clearly, because he, he died in 2017. Um, yeah. And some people are saying this is amazing because it's, it's paying homage to the, to the artist. What kind, of, yeah. what kind of, I mean, you must have had some first-hand comments. What kind of comments have you had since you've been making these shadow figures? Uh, you know, knowing, going at this, knowing that you're going to antagonize every, everybody that, maybe wants to be antagonized by it. And there's a lot of art police rules that, that go along with that. And I, honestly, I was really excited to get dissent and to, and critique because it's really a visceral reaction to what you believe should or shouldn't happen. And those, I think some of the most honest reactions and my favorite and the, some of them were like, would, would Richard approve of this? That's a really great, that's a really great comment. Would Richard approve after he died that that's it? No more shadow men for the rest of human history. No shadow men, no, none of this language should ever go beyond looking at your phone on, at a picture of a shadow man in the eighties. So I, I kind of postulate that is that you know, I don't think a lot of people think that far when they when they react to it. And I, and I feel like, um, you know, that's a, uh, is it appropriation? You know, is it, is it, uh, uh, does it devalue all the work that's out there? And those concerns, because uh, the, when you fall in love with an artist, or you've, you've grown up with them, or you know, uh, someone like Richard, um, it's, you become very precious with um, the perception, especially public perception, and also kind of how the art uh, may be seen. You want people to see his art versus, uh, you know, a second-hand version of it, you know, or a, a second-best version of it on the streets, you know, you know, like the stuff that I'm doing. And uh, uh, so being really aware of, of that, um, before even doing this, really considering and talking and, and seeing this through. And the, the kind of consensus was, 
it's better to have more out there and to confront the current culture with them than to put Hamiltons on digital screens and bus stops and you don't feel anything, you know, from wheat pasting, I'm putting something like that up. So in homage, there's a lot of risk to it. And I think um, giving them a conversation, uh, you could see the shoulders kind of come down from the ears and, and, and see that, that that was, they kind of see the long-term aspect. And so I, the, the gut reaction is, is, how dare you? And I, I've totally, I totally love that how dare you gut reaction. But the long-term reaction is creating a conversation that all leads to, to Richard's life and work and this scattered puzzle that we're all a part of now. And doing this kind of work was designed to create conversations and get people to bring their, their piece of the puzzle because there's so much of Richard's work that actually hasn't been seen publicly. And as you all know, that's, that's a, that's a big, um, that's a big uh, aspect of what we're trying to do is, is a true retrospective that, that can show his, his full body of work. And um, the people that I feel that have really high emotions uh, have a story to tell because they have their own story to, to bring. And that's one of the best things about your podcast was that call to, uh, that call to action to go, Hey, we, there's stories. Come on, come here. We'll, we'll talk about it and we'll add, we'll take your piece of the puzzle and add it to the table. So this act is more like uh, creating the table so that everybody feels comfortable with each other. Cause as you know, we've, I've heard and talked this, you know, there's a lot of factions around Richard's life that don't talk to each other. Mm. And this table that um, you can create, uh, we don't even know what this puzzle really looks like yet. Yeah. And getting all this, this shattered kind of puzzle. And I think, you know, that'd be funny if, if Richard actually had that kind of plan with, with this kind of work was, it was a uh, fantastic that he just never signed a shadow man. Hey, go, this is me. Or never signed a, a mass murder outline. Hey, this is me. So there are, they are kind of puzzle piece shaped and this, it's a very meta uh, art exhibition we're pulling off, which is, you know, kind of the mass murder attitude by using the, um, the shadow man in this. So without really telling anybody what the real plan is and what, you know, what was the, the pull to do this? What was the irrational drive to pull this off? Um, uh, the, the gut reaction was, 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 I would say 20% absolutely negative and then 80% positive. Good. If that's the longest answer I can give you, sorry. No, it's, it's great. Um, there's already been in South London... Um, where I'm from, uh, duplicates of of your work. It's funny because you're you're the guy behind these current shadow figures. Hence, why the New York yeah. Times spoke about it. But now people yeah. are copying your move in another part of the world, <laughs> where great. I'm from. And that we've actually yeah. had a few people, you know, even very credible organisations saying, "Oh, this this has to be something to do with Woodbury House," and we're saying it's not. And I, I, I actually yeah. thought it might be you, but of course it's not because you're in America. Um, you know, why do you think people are doing this now? Do you think people are all jumping, jumping on the bandwagon because they find it exciting, or do you think it's I think something, something to do? Same thing, like uh, the Shadow Man. Uh, uh, let's say, let's go back to the mass murder thing, and the mass murder thing was Richard appropriating a very well mythologized uh, public or uh, uh, an investigative technique with a chalk outline over a, a dead body at a murder scene. And that mythology transfers really well at that time. And, and he knew how to manipulate that mythology and twist it so that people felt something different, you know, to, to really be conv convinced 
that it was real when it wasn't. And that's kind of the same thing like the Coen brothers did with the Fargo film and the start of the film. They said, this is a, this is a true story. And without the internet, no one had anything to say that it wasn't a true story. So they watched the whole film feeling it was a, it was a true story. And so these shadow men, you know, they're kind of like haikus. They're, they're a visual poetry and it's not really anybody's um, property. You know, our shadows are our shadows and, and Richard, you know, is the, he generated and was the catalyst to that kind of language. I mean, there was cave paintings. When if you were to go into a cave and you didn't know there was a 10,000 year old cave painting, you'd be pretty amazed. And that kind of effect has, when you see cave paintings as a kid or when you draw these basic um, outlines of figures, it's, it's, a, it's a human, it's a very human haiku language. And the attraction is, is like, it's a very subversive, language to to play with and when you see other people um, running that language including myself and uh going out uh, you you don't really have a choice if you really need to do it it's not really a choice you just got to go out and, and and place them and so um you know the the difference in what's maybe happening in in, in london is uh, you know, my plan was, and which the execution of this was, is um, we're creating constellations around each city. And the constellations of these shadow men, um, if you were to look at a Google map, um, the constellations actually create a chalk outline of a mass murder scene, um, like what Richard did. So, uh, you know, uh, thought a lot about doing, uh, replicating the mass murder outlines, but that mythology is lost on today's culture. You know, we have all the forensic file shows and these don't do that anymore. It's no reason to, uh, to put chalk outlines. And so it wouldn't have any effect and no one would actually feel anything if you saw a chalk outline. And with painted blood, you know, it's be just a throwback retro kind of sticker you would put on the ground and, and, and just, you just shrug your shoulders, oh, I gotta step over it. So understanding this kind of base psychology to do this mass murder project, which is really what this is, is another mass murder 2.0 um, uh, project was uh, putting a mass murder outline on top of a city map and then doing as many shadow men precisely placed to, to match that map so that that was the actually coup de grace of, of, of it. You know, we didn't explain that to New York Times and didn't even explain that to the, to the people that were kind of close to this project um, and that. And so, cause I wanted them to be surprised as well. And uh, you know, there's a website and there's, you know, there's a, there's a map and everything like that. I haven't, I haven't revealed that until, until now, but that, that was the, uh, the, the big intention was to, to replicate a mass murder project, but on, on today's culture and the shadow mount are just kind of links in the chain and to go and pull that off and not practice them to start completely shitty going out there and trying it and then successfully going from one to next to a higher risk location higher risk locations with the something that was even closer to you know a, a semi a close approach to what Richard had did. And then we separated, not we, but I separated the, the scary street art ones from the figurative kind of dignified ones that, that he did in paintings as to ones, the dignified ones were the closer ones to the streets and the scarier ones were often to places that were, that were closer to the, to the pathology behind Richard's need to do that. And, and Nima Labrizi and everybody did help out with, with, um, that where to place and, and how to, to really create an homage to, to, to Richard's work. But it's, it's not the eighties, it's 2021. So the placement changes, the language and the effect is, is a, lot, um, a lot more contemporary now because people are prepared for these kind of things. 
happen. But the one thing is that, you know, it's journey about looking at uh, New York is, is, you know, spending that much time there. Uh, the, the amount of street art that's on the streets, like the amount of work that goes up on the streets. Uh, it's so common and you just don't, um, you can almost gloss over it like, like uh, um, trees now. And that wasn't the case in obviously the eighties. There, uh, there, there wasn't the volume of people and the volume of spaces and the volume of respect for it that it has now. Um, but you just don't, that shadow man language doesn't exist. And it really is, a, is it really is separates itself uh, um, uh, from all the colors, you know, from, from all the, from all the artwork that's out there. Hmm. And so with, um, you know, to see the, the new stuff in London, it's great. You know, I, I think it's great. Um, you know, there's a plan for London, same thing as, is location, the map location that's already been kind of, that's been, uh, mapped out already for for that and that's part of it is is if you find them all then you can then you can know what the actual shape looks like we're not going to give you the shape of the uh the uh the the outline but we're gonna we're gonna say that that shape exists in in the same way that it's um uh, you know it's like um an easter egg hunt yeah so yeah. so basically the concept is when you look at a map from a bird's eye view Everywhere yeah. you put a shadow figure will actually outline a mass murder or a murder scene. Absolutely. Right? So With the blood and everything. So it's a bit like a, a hybrid. You know, it's a hybrid piece. So you're not only yeah. just doing the shadow figures, but that turns into a much bigger piece. And as you say, it's more current, more modern. You know, people are going to yeah, re- recognize this. It's a, you know, a contemporary... Uh, vision of of richard's first ambition with mass murder you know yeah. you, you know the mass murder we were talking about it's like you really have to do like a, a a hollywood quality dead body on the street to really cause the same ruckus that that he did like no one was spared you just think of grandmas and, and police and the news media and everybody seeing mass murder scenes uh across you know, an already anxious, you know, end of the seventies America. That is such a huge move, and to do so many, I think it was up to close to a six hundred uh, that he that he pulled off um, uh, everywhere. You know, across the across the United States. So to pull off six hundred, to pull off that many mass murder scenes, you know, and to create that kind of thing, that's exactly. That's exactly what I would do. It's exactly the kind of life I've lived um, myself. And I really, really love that about uh, the first part of Richard's um, artistic career. I just really think that's, that's, it's a, it's something I would, you know, have drinks over with him if that was the, if that was the case. And I think all of that kind of, that kind of youth, um, the, you know, the ability to fuck with society in, in that way, in a, in a, in a pleasant way, not, not in a, in a truly damaging way, but, uh, that comes, that comes from a, a, a kind of, um, a rascal or, or a, a, a need to, to, to lie, you know, it's really to, to lie and to see people's true reactions about lie. No, okay, I'm just kidding. You know, it's like, I have cancer. Everybody freaks out. It's like, no, I'm just kidding. It's like, you asshole. So we all do that to each other. And I think the, the, that aspect, um, not many people have, have, I don't know if anybody has really pulled off um, something as, as vast as that mass murder project. You know? So um, you're clearly making some headway and obviously people are talking. How many shadow figures have you done so far? So, um, 143 in, in New York City in, in 15 nights. So, that was uh, like eight in Times Square, which was almost impossible just to even get one because of how dense the, um, how dense the, 
DHS and, and the police were at that moment were doing it. I mean, I was doing it. And so uh, it really was just hiding in plain sight uh, vibe. So the equipment and everything and the paint and, and the, the uh, it was, you know, about between 2.30 and 6.30 in the morning. And so the highest risk places, you, know, you just, uh, you, you found a, a kind of a docile period uh, and in the night where you could, you could pull off um, um, something. Cause a lot of these at the start were taking about eight, eight minutes to do. And then um, towards the end, I was getting down to, uh, you know, four and a half minutes with the right kind of formula for the paint. And, and, and that was the other thing it was the paint was, uh, you know, a watered down latex. So it, it, really was easy to wash off. So it wasn't just a, you know, a, uh, there was kind of, res there is a respect to a lot of the architecture going towards using a paint that, you know, wouldn't leave any, 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 when you did wash it off, it wouldn't leave any evidence or any kind of damage or, you know, change discoloration or anything like that. Yeah. Um, being an artist mm -hmm. and also being a fan of, of Hamilton's work, it, are these shadow figure things that you've practiced before, like many years ago, or do you just suddenly attack these walls? Absolutely not. I didn't want to have that. You know? Yeah, no, absolutely not. I didn't want to have that um, uh, practice it and practice it and say, hey, look, I can do them really good. I really wanted to be honest and, and, and go out and do it only under the duress of getting caught. And I think that's kind of, a, that's what I surmised from all the stories and, and, and watching and everything, like, you know, the multiples of people asking about, about um, how they were done and when they were done. And, and uh, the, there wasn't pra the practicing was just on the streets for Richard. And so just to, to follow that same kind of rule is, is, you know, if you really look at a lot of Richards, they're, <laughs> some were fantastic and some were, awkward looking and somewhere you know and i think that's that's an honest way to go about it so i didn't practice at all the first one was the first time i'd put paint on a wall and uh outside and uh and i wanted to see picture by picture the the, the progress you know and right about the end was i think a couple where i felt it was like this is kind of the the, the start of the language he was he was producing so I think if you look at the archives, uh, the old uh, shadow figures in yeah. the streets of New York from the Shadow Man documentary and any of the books, yeah. um, some of your shadow figures are very uncanny. I mean, they're very, very close to, to the real, real McCoy or, or the real thing, which is great. Um, how did you feel? How do you feel when you're painting them at the time? Is it a thrill are you a bit nervous that you might get caught mm -hmm. by, by the authorities? I mean, how would you feel if you got arrested by the police as you're doing a shadow figure? Uh, I actually got stopped by one, uh, uh, a set of people because it was, uh, it just looked sketchy what I was doing. I was going down to one of the, the lower kind of basement uh, steps. <laughs> and they saw me and I just was like, came up and was honest, like, hey, this is an art exhibition. Um, I'm, I'm I'm using just uh, watercolor paint and stuff. And they're like, they looked at me. I was like, beat it. <laughs> I was like, beat it, kid. Like, get out of here. Oh, wow. So, um, but the, that happened right at the end. So that was the first only and only time. But the, the time of doing it, you know, I talked to Al Diaz uh, and midway through this and, uh, uh, and the, uh, you know, I'm paraphrasing, but like the, you can't go back. It's once you do it, um, and particularly when you're throwing paint, actually throwing this, this kind of tarish sauce and Nemo was, had, had amazing poetry to talk about, like what the, what the kind of consistency and what the paint was. So when you're planning it all and you're putting that kind of, that kind of um, paint together and you have your, your system, um, you know, doing it, it's a flow state, just like being an athlete. You're not worried about the police. You're not worried about uh, Richard or you're not worried about opinions or, or anything. And I think most 
artists and most people want to find a flow state. And it's kind of similar to Jack White's thing where he was, um, uh, he's doing vinyl again and that's not new. It's just, he's doing, I think it's called three man records and he wanted to get, he wanted to get, uh, uh bands to record, really actually record, do a one, one pull recording where it's, it's, it's just on the vinyl. There's no editing to it. There's nothing, there's no engineering to it. You, and they tend to play a lot different when they just have one chance to do it. And I, I think going on the streets and doing that um, to see how it felt was, uh, was fantastic. It's a fantastic uh, experience because it's a, it's, you're forcing yourself to be in a flow state, just like an athlete. So it's, it's a, it's fun. And there's no, there was no, uh, there was no outline. There was no uh, um, stencil. It was just a memorize one and, and, and try to get it as close to what the memory was. So when you're walking by as a pedestrian, so you obviously you're not in your, you know, disguise or you're not trying to be undercover. You must have seen one of your shadow figures and another pedestrian walk past and there's a reaction. What kind of reaction is that? Uh, the only time I saw that was when uh, the New York Times journalist, um, Bob Morris, uh, I told him to tag along. And uh, so he was actually interested in what people thought. So I chanced it and went earlier than I usually do just so you can get the reactions. And, and uh, I think everybody appreciates uh, someone willing to risk it. And that was the common reaction. I think about four or five people were watching. It was like, it's just fun to watch someone uh, have an irrational need to do that. And under the duress of getting caught or whatever it is for the, for the gift of public art. So there were, there were everyone that we saw was, um, was uh, uh, kind of entranced by it. And even Bob himself was a, he was a, a really cool person to, to kind of share it with. And you could see him being subverted by the idea of, of this. And he started going, hey, you should put one over here. You know, he's starting to have his own ideas because it's, it's a very easy thing to be subverted by. Mm. And it's, I think it, it brings most people back down to being a child. You know, there's a little child inside each adult that wants to, play with the world kind of like a sandbox just move sand from here to there and and not worry about the um the order of it so yeah yeah i, I think that. people are attracted by the subversion they're subverted by 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 the act of it um there's going to be some clients collectors or just people listening to this podcast and they're going to be thinking okay the shadow figures what about other styles of Hamilton, landscapes, rodeos, shadow cats, you know, love hearts. Any of these, or is it purely and simply for you, the shadow figures? So when I approached Andy, there was, you know, a lot of this was in context of, you know, if we wanted to do replications of his work. Uh, nothing could be on something you could sell. You know, we're not trying to do forgeries or, you know, like, it's a true homage but what was a what was an interesting thought was you know it would probably wouldn't go any further than than shadow men or even horse all the the rodeo stuff um, um and the, a lot of the language was putting the the canvas style paintings on on the outside instead of them being on the inside and looking for abandoned um, places around the world to do what I called uh, gallery abandoned, and we have a huge romance with with abandoned um, places. There's YouTube shows you've probably seen them where just people go and walk around abandoned houses in, in England and in France, and you just you know the same thing with with um, with buildings and hospitals, and you're looking at the at the, the 
you know, essentially a, a civilization or a culture or, or a family that's not there anymore. And I really felt that the, the aesthetic, if you wanted to do these, these um, doing a kind of a pop-up gallery show of his work, of Richard's language, it's not just his work, but the, the language he was, uh, he was striving for, uh, to be able to put that kind of work and replicate it as, you know, uh, as best as you could to do that and leave them in these, in these uh, abandoned places as if, you know, it was just a, a gallery that was there for a bit. And, um, but nothing, in, you know, the, the beautiful paintings, the, the, the blood irises, the blood paintings, the, uh, that whole body of work, um, it, it'll be left alone. That's, it's the mass murder and the, and the, and the shadow men are, are the kind of the, the public art uh, realm. And yeah. those are breadcrumbs that lead to what our responsibility, like Woodbury House and, and all the collectors that have their their puzzle pieces and our responsibility, like hold this this whole aspect is to our breadcrumbs to lead everybody to um, coming together and bringing Richard's entire catalog resume to a one time whatever view of a, a true like retrospective and you know I was talking to Ken um, emailing we just email um, often and he's a fantastic character in this he is, yeah he was very skeptical at first and you know he, he started to understand that that silence he's he wrote something really well was that the not talking about this or the silence aspect of of uh, with Richard is worse than you know what what I'm trying to do and what you know what what all this is about and i knew that this would wedge this would be a wedge in and getting people off their seat and all the collectors to really bring out their collections so that um the public can actually see the collections because just in my opinion with access to the most of the the um the high res uh images of his work uh, and when I show, um, and I co you clearly, you know, you do the same, you've had the same experience where you show someone who thinks they've seen all of his work and you're like, I've never seen that before. Mm -hmm. And, uh, to get everybody, all the collectors to, to finally kind of talk to each other, like, you know, the Woodwards and, and, uh, Andy and Ken's and, and everybody who's, who's, who's generally has a, a good body of, of rich work. So if they all get to, we all get everybody together, we can finally kind of look at this huge wall and put all his work on, on a, um, on a timeline and just marvel at how many styles and how much everyone who's been a fan has, hasn't seen. And I think, in my opinion, I think the public's only seen about 25% of Richard's total catalog. I, I agree with that. Um, yeah. So in your view, in your mind, in your experience, where does Richard go in the history books? Uh, I had a really great discussion with, um, um, with uh, a person involved in this and, and um uh, she coined this as as Richard being one of the four horsemen of the eighties, and it, you kind of right there wedged between Warhol and Basquiat and Herring, and you know we all know the if you look at the chronology of of their lives and you put Richard and Richard's timeline just goes all the way up to two thousand seventeen and you have um, Basquiat and you have Herring and Warhol just kind of die within a, a year of each other. And uh, the kind of wish, the kind of the way people feel about Richard's um, endeavors uh, and, his, and his body of work uh, feel like it, he's, he's a, a part of, the, of that um, core experience in the art world that um everybody knows but no one knows and this effort was 
was inching him, trying to inch him up closer onto that rodeo horse next to everybody right there, instead of him being kind of knocked down and not talked about. And uh, whether that's true, I mean, that's, that's subjective, but uh, I say anybody who, who pulled off a mass murder series <laughs> as his first, as Mr. Ree, um, uh, you know, that's, he, a lot of people owe, owe their careers to that kind of behavior. And I, I really, I really think that, that just on that is, is that was a world series, you know, win for him uh, um, to, to put him close to that aspect of saying like, he's one of the four horsemen of the eighties art culture. So. I, I love, I love that analogy. Would you say yeah. as a first time collector, would you say as a first time investor, would you say Ham- Hamilton's a, a good purchase? I, absolutely. I, I don't own any, um, uh, I'm not really into collect. I like, I like, the work ethic of creating and creating, creating. So, but the, the aspect of, of owning this, you know, a puzzle piece, it's really what it is. It's not just, and if you look at Warhol's life and you look at his, his, uh, his body of work, it's all the puzzle pieces have been put together. It's done. Everybody around the table can look at the Warhol's entire catalog and go, it's done. There's nothing much to add. Maybe a couple pieces like every puzzle, there's one something missing. Same with the boss squat, herring. Those puzzles have been finished. And everybody knows that puzzle and everybody knows that, you know, there are there are you know a few pieces and, and that that you can own and and then there's print productions and then there's commercialization and and I always part of this is not just owning what's interesting about it is is when you look at richard's these are his paintings are really puzzle pieces and you're owning part of a puzzle that's still being put together and i think that's a really cool analogy is that uh it, you're you're owning a puzzle piece to something that no one knows what it actually totally looks like and uh you know whether you like the art market value or whether you have some morality with with the, how things change but if you look at it in the mythology of, of of a puzzle piece being put into a larger puzzle and once it's done it's it's always going to increase in value and but you know most of the people i talk are collectors or are rational collectors you you like it and and not even just for its value it's uh and um yeah i think it's a it's a a smart a fun investment because you're you're now part of a a story that's that's hasn't been finished yet and that's not the case in in a lot of um art collection now a lot of these stories are done you're looking at someone posthumous but even posthumously with richard (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> this story is not done with everybody's with everybody's stories and with everybody's kind of view uh, i think we'll get a much more rounded view of, of who richard is and what his body work is when when more of the collectors and more people show their work and we, we pull that off how do you see the richard hamilton market shaping over the next five ten fifteen years uh, it's it's like a slow animation of, of assembling the, the puzzle pieces, you know, with more videos, you know, podcasts or more uh, of his work assembling and being able to see it. Uh, there's a satisfaction to understanding, you know, this, it's kind of the same thing. I mean, there's a, there's an obvious design metaphor of this whole mass murder thing, which up close, you can see the shadow men on the streets and then you pull away on Google maps, you know, you know google earth and you see the map of what they look like and on there and it's kind of the same thing you know assembling all richard's catalog on the table and this is happening in real time over every year and having a location you know website and and uh, the the creation of a foundation that that can um uh 
is a path for people new to uh, to Richard and, and people who know Richard or knew Richard having these digital and, and physical paths to to go and see what the what that puzzle looks like so um, every year the puzzle gets more clear and every year that's just always going to increase the value of, of Richard's work. Richard's work and it's an increase the 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 awareness of his work those two always go hand in hand the awareness and, and, and the value and they can't be separated so I know there's a lot of kind of moral what's the how do you hold the commercialization in check with with the awareness how do those two things uh, are they always parallel or one should be always be ahead or you know we've seen where one's things that are over commercialized and so there's this balance that um and i think with the with the new york times you know uh placed out there was was a, a, a big deal which is you know selling your copyright willingly to someone to protect it like andy and uh um so the awareness of a commercialist awareness that the stuff that his work was going to increase in value you know so mm. um, i feel like i'm giving you a really long explanation no i Sorry. love it it's very very in depth and um on the note of the new york times i mean i know how big of a deal it, it, it is because I live and breathe this market in Hamilton. I mean, yeah. I've interviewed Ken Moss, uh, yeah. Dr. Norman Turkovitz, who is not a famous yeah. guy, but, you know, he used to look after Richard's teeth. Mike Melbourne from Frank yeah. Chop Shop, you know, a friend of his, a dealer, um, someone that used to look yeah. after him. He's amazing. I hung out with him a bunch of times. Too. He's cool, very, very cool guy. I've got a lot of respect <laughs> for him. Um, so much fun. Yeah. Obviously, people are like out Diaz, LA2, crash cope uh yep. days and these are all people that are in the ecosystem of hambleton so when yeah. when the new york times you know wrote about him again everyone knows it's a big deal but from your perspective because you're in new york i'm here in london how, how are people talking about that article you know are they saying this is absolutely tremendous this is moving mountains or what's their view uh, on it i, I I would be concerned if the article was just all good, um, called good uh, responses. Uh, I, the article got the perfect balance of negative and positive. And without the negative and positive being there, it wouldn't be, it wouldn't be a, a fair or kind of a, an interesting article. And the, the negative to it was, you know, the obviously you know the one thing I, I would be burdened with with the article was was having to mention the uh, the null bureau name you know I'm just not not interested in, in but that's just the way they had to do it I was I was against actually having you know a name attached to it at all and I would rather have Richard's name um, be mentioned more often but the 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 kind of the negative responses were, were um, that this is, you know, without knowing what I've told you in this podcast, uh, you could easily surmise it's a, it's a, it's a commercial, absolutely a commercial uh, uh, campaign to increase the value of, of everyone's work. And, you know, with that, I find that fascinating because like that's uh, you know a lot of the people that that wanted that felt negatively you felt that it was what they wanted to be true that this is a a, a really complex way to commercialize or to you know however that that the they thought that that was <laughs> that was going to come out as being this commercial experience and this is how um, this is the new way of, of, of a strategy of increasing the value of, of someone's catalog or collection. And I always thought, well, there was a, there was a time where the New York Times photographer, um, 
I had planned out the, uh, a spot uh, with a suggestion by uh, uh, Nadine Johnson. Um, she suggested uh, the Bergdorf Goodman building next to the, the below the Central Park. And um, so I scoped it out. And I remember seeing this bus stop that's right in front of me. It's a perfectly clean bus stop, it's a glass bus stop. And it, there was an old lady sitting at it. And uh, there, if you've been in New York, you know that there are these advertising TVs at all the common um, uh, transportation locations, so bus stops. So these TV screens are massive. And they are like bat signals. They're so bright. And I can remember seeing this old lady sit next there and this TV screen was just right, right there, just like your iPhone to hundred percent in the darkest room. And she was just being blasted. You could see her. she was almost like being bent by the amount of um, um, light that was going on. I was like, oh, that's a perfect place for a shadowman was just to, to create a shadow on whoever's sitting in that seat. And, but it, I really loved the idea because if we were to, if I had asked Andy, Hey, do you want a commercial, you know, you want to put up some money or whatever it is? Uh, Cause I don't, you know, I'm, I don't have the money to, to, to put anything digital on a, on a bus stop. And it's like, would you, <laughs> it never even consider it would never even, it crossed our minds uh, to, it, it never crossed my mind and it would it never crossed the conversation to go hey this find 200 g's of two hundred thousand dollars and just put digital shadow men on all the bus stops and just blow everybody away with marketing if you really wanted to go corporate and i go that'd be more offensive to use richard hamilton's language on digital screens or to put them on posters or to put them on wheat paste things, you know, that really require no risk, zero risk. And so the negative thing about the article was, was kind of really myopic. It was focused on, well, this is a, this is a corporate, this is a corporate um, commercial clever thing to do. Uh, and uh, that wasn't the case. You know, I would never do a project. I was like, yeah, I just put, take a digital image, send it to the guys on buses and put it all over buses and you're done. No one wants that. And for a real homage that was, you know, approaching Richard's, the day of Richard's, you know, the day he died, I thought, you know, it has to be paint. It actually has to be paint thrown on, on the walls. And it can't be just stencils and easy stuff like that. It has to you have to go from the hardest point and do it. And without any discussion, you know, people want to throw out the, the, the worst that it could be. That was, those were the easiest kind of um, attacks on the, on the whole thing was that uh, there are street art rules. You didn't listen to them. This is appropriation. This is horrible. Uh, and uh, uh, I love those. Those are my favorite comments. The ones that people love, like uh, people that have grown up in the 80s and like, oh, so good to see those up again. That's, e that's really easy to like. But the critiques on that, um, you know, I, I love seeing that, that the people were uh, just really disturbed by even acting this way. I think, you know, I th um, I think you gotta, you've got to embrace it all, uh, to be honest, what you're doing. So... Yeah. The shadow figures, obviously known by Hamilton, the current shadow figures are owned by the mystery mask, masked artist in front of us. Will the world ever know who you are in, in years to come? I'm sure. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not interested in the in the in the in the, the hidden thing. This is more of kind of our suggestions, and for now, this is you know going to go out. But I love, I I do work for everybody, and you know. Uh, on every aspect of design, uh, industrial design, aerospace, to uh, yeah, to, <laughs> to every aspect of creative elements and 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 
music video to animation to cell animation to to every but i i really enjoy the 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 idea of doing work without um burdening people with the, the mythology it's kind of like saying uh this is really expensive wine and then your brain just says it's expensive wine and changes the flavor and you do do stuff like this um you know obviously a you can tell by my voice I'm um, American, but a lot of the work we've done, you know, uh, what's fun about it is uh, people, if you don't tell the the sex of, you know, what the, what your gender is and what your age is and what your background is, and you just put it up there, then the, then they can see it as kind of close to the art as possible without having to be subject a mythology, a personal cultural mythology with, with what the, what and who and what their politics are and all that. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I would have rather not be mentioned or, you know, um, be associated with it. But in this, I think there's a, there's a merit in saying that putting a face or putting in at least a name to, and a reason to the homage, uh, to this and, 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 you know, standing up for the attack, standing up for the critique, and and uh, it, it, at least you know any person that wants to go out and put Shadow Man out there, it's it's great. But the I don't think the New York Times wants to to or any kind of journalistic body or art body wants to do an article about someone who paid some money to put a, a Hamilton's on a digital screen. Yeah, yeah, true. Um, really, it comes down to that. What's um. What's next for you? What's your next move? What are you going to be doing? Well, we have a whole list of cities and a whole list of vast, you know, far away locations to 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 increase this language up on and 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 direct people towards uh, Richard's uh, life and history. With the more the more cities there are, the the more awareness and the more need for everybody's catalog to kind of collect in one one spot. So we're kind of here, you know, on the, on the screen here, kind of here with doing this and then everybody's catalog and stories is increasing. So hopefully they meet at a point where we can have the largest catalog of the visual catalog of his works. Um, and uh, I really don't see it ever stopping. I always see like, you know, getting shadow men as far as, you know, Chernobyl and, Antarctica and, and, you know, just amazing places that have nothing to do with the cities either. So and that was yeah, the, uh, that. that was the, I think I did six weeks of deck work just to prove how beautiful it would be in all these vast locations, you know, and uh, uh, just before I even um, approached Andy um, uh, about the, the whole thing. And uh, it's it's almost peer reviewed. Showing the whole thing was a peer review, and then ex executing it in New York, which is one of the hardest places not to get caught. You know, like yeah. Uh, and so New York's a good um, boot camp, and that's uh, hopefully with a better explanation about the mass murder. I think. Um, you'll get a lot more empathy about uh, uh, and a collective of people that want to support um, pulling these, uh, this, this kind of live um, conceptual art exist, exhibit of, of Richard's psychology. You know, it's not just the, the artwork and simulating rich, the shadow men, it's simulating the psychology about willing to, to impose an idea on modern culture. And it's not, and I mean, I really mean imposing that idea. And a lot of people don't like being imposed upon, you know, if, you know, like if uh, it's, it's disruptive. And then, but the people that really love it, like us, or a lot of the, uh, uh, I actually just talked to a, uh, a lady, her name is Jamie Delinko, and I talked to her yesterday, and she actually has 15 amazing photographs, and I'll connect her with you 
of um, Richard in, in Amsterdam. She has 15 shadow men in Amsterdam and she has some of the best photographs of it. She's a photographer and she's actually up in Vancouver. And uh, so she has her own story uh, about that. And I had explained the same thing to her. You know, first of all, it's skeptical. And then it's like, oh, that's, that's amazing. And so yeah, cool. hopefully we can get a, a, a mass murder on as many cities as possible. That'd be decent. Yeah. If you can connect me, I'll be, uh, I'll be that, that I really appreciate that. Um, yeah. So Banksy, everyone talks about Banksy, especially lately because yeah. one of his pieces in Sotheby's went for over 80 million pounds, sets a new record. Yeah. And it's the one that most people affiliate to Banksy now, which is the half shredded piece, which is, Love is yeah. in the bin. Um, in the Shadow Man documentary, they reference Banksy drawing inspiration from Hamilton. You speak to any big collector who collects Warhol, Basquiat, Haring, or any of the greats. They, they reference all the time Banksy and, and, and Hamilton. In your own view, how much of a connection is there to Banksy and Richard Hamilton? Oh, there's 100%. Um parallel i mean it's it's the same psychology it's the same irrational drive to impose a, an idea on society without asking for permission and that's not a common characteristic on on people uh you know most people aren't out imposing um you know of the of the total population of the world how many writers are there how many musicians how many how many uh, directors and podcasts? I mean, like everyone else has got their own um, uh, ambitions. And, and Banksy, you know, that the drives are uh, almost one and the same. You know, like uh, to, I mean, I love the, the connection between the two. They're, they're two uh, dominoes, you know, either side by side or one's, you know, hit the, the next just. Hamilton, Banksy, and seeing that it's the same thing. I, I got hit by that domino. Oh, you can do that? That's exactly what I would do. You know, that's the kind of behavior I had as a, a throughout my life is, oh, I love seeing that, that behavior, just like any kid sees a, their favorite athlete or race car driver. Oh, that's a beautiful act of, of, uh, um, it's a beautiful human act and either you're rejected or you feel viscerally like I want to do nothing about it or you feel like oh I have to do something that's exactly what I would do or what I would want to do or so I would hope the you know, just surmising that you that uh, Banksy felt the same way about Richard's um, behavior not the artwork but the why and I liken it to you know, like Banksy and, and Hamilton, I liken it to the first time I heard a, a piece of music that I loved. And I remember as a kid, which is a strange piece of music to, to fall in love with, but uh, at seven years old, my, my mom played um, uh, Mozart for the first time. And for the first time, you know, the, the I think it's the 25th symphony. It's the one that starts out in Amadeus. And, and uh, I'm, I remember coming online as a kid, like you're just in kind of a fuzz playing, you know, with your Legos or whatever it is. And she played that music and boom, I came on, I, I came online. I was like, what is that? Play that over again. And I always found that fascinating because I had never heard the music before clearly. And no one ever taught me that music or go, Hey son, when you hear these notes, get really excited. Like, no. So that, that ignorance, the vacuum of not knowing something to experiencing it, going from here to the threshold of experiencing a, a work of art like music, it's a profound experience. And uh, it's undeniable. It's and the one teaches you to fall in love with the girl that's over there or the boy over there, whatever the, uh, that you fall in love with, but you know it and you come online as a kid and, and are attracted to it for the rest of your life. You're attracted to that experience of going from not knowing to knowing. And that's that ignorance to experience. That's some of the best you'll ever feel. And so the thing with public art with Banksy 
is saving that experience the same thing. You went from the public aspect of, of waking up, going out of your house, and this piece of art wasn't there yesterday. And no one told me it was going to be there. So it's really the reverse of a gallery experience saying, hey, we're going to do this big experience for you. Here's some trailer images. But you've already, you've already told them what the images are. So the people know what to expect when they go in. You know, there's a reality expected. What does it smell like? Or what, it, what does it feel like to be there and talk to people? But with the public art thing with Banksy and, and Hamilton, they informed nobody. There was no, hey, we're going to talk to the art community and the street art community. We're going to send our, our forms in and our, and our club, you know, our club expenditure. You know, our, our art police, we got to support the art police. We don't want to make them mad. We're going to tell everybody what we're going to do. And we're going to make it the most predictable experience possible. And we're going to get it verified and triplicate. And everybody's going to sign off. And you can only put it on this wall, but not this wall. And put it in front of Macy's, but not too close to Macy's. None of that is there. So to see Banksy, you know, see Hamble, Richard act in that manner, asking no one's permission for a conceptual idea and letting people wake up and go and see the art and go from that zero to that visceral experience of snapping, oh, there's a shadow man right there. That's a really, really hard gift to give because there's not a lot of money in that gift, you know, when you first start doing that. And uh, to see, you know, that's the kind of nature with Banksy's work. And that's where they both shake hands. Uh, you know, the baton was passed uh, from one to the other across the finish line. Each time they do an exhibition is you're presenting the public with this gift of a chance to fall in love with it without anything in between you and the art. And that's a, that's a really, really hard thing to pull off. And there's only one way to pull it off is, is not telling anybody you're going to do it. Yeah. So I hope that's a good explanation. I think you know, what, I, what I see the, yeah. the, the DNA that they both share and the, and the, the psychology they both share. And the psychology that, that I feel like uh, that I, I share and that most of us share with that is people create surprise parties and they, they create movies. And, you know, I recently watched Dune. It's the same thing. Like you just watch it. And you're just so happy that so many thousands of people got together and created a, a movie like, you know, Dune or any movie that you like. So it's mm -hmm. the, it's the why. And I think Banksy has the same why as, as, as Richard. Um, Earlier, you said about the commercialization of an artist versus their, and you didn't say these words, but like the preservation of their narrative and story and legacy. You know, there's a, there's a fine balance between yeah. that. Because if you go, you know, on one of those points a bit too heavily, it can send the market in a completely different direction. I mean, if you try and over commercialize an artist, it can send it yeah. completely, completely downwards. And with Banksy, I feel like he's a bit of a genius with this because if you're looking at the figures from his originals yeah. to his even signed and unsigned limited editions, which are going for hundreds of thousands and the yeah. originals market are going for millions. Um, I've, I've seen Banksy in the last 18 months was flying then it suddenly plateaued slightly. And mm -hmm. the moment he done a public stunt and some kind of public art um or something that the masses could see and then the papers and then the the tv channels started talking about him it meant that the auction started popping off again hence why we just had a record it's no coincidence that a few weeks before that he was doing some stuff on the streets and then suddenly the auction result popped off many are saying that with what you're doing and with what the foundation are doing and with the new york times and stuff going on over here we're probably about to see a record-breaking Hamilton result. Would you support yeah, that? Yeah, I think that's, you know, it's, it's a, the, like, what's the, the uncertainty principle? We're all part of the zeitgeist, right? We're all part of a, a kind of a, uh, you know, a, an intercollective uh, connection, not to go like um, existential on it, but, you know, there is that same vacuum. Um, I think there is, with Banksy, um, 
there's a commonality to that to that uh, commercialization because everybody wants to own something that everybody knows about but only one person can own like there's a there's a there is a uh that's in our dna that's what makes you fuck you know like that's what scarcity of of attractiveness goes to like this person has this quality and this person doesn't so there's there's a a natural social sexual market for for scarcity and 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 uh what's common and um you know with that how that works with commercialization is you know i think what now is is we're in a we're in like a um like the second industrial revolution which means the ideas of putting artwork on a product is really easy where 30 years ago wasn't that easy it wasn't that easy to to put any piece of art on a football or a train set or you know whatever it is and it, it that's just an aspect of that someone's going to connect those dots and go if we put a well-known piece of work on a well-known common object that uh, will create some type of uh, return on that and and that goes all the way up to to um, this idea that if you just do it for the art um, everyone's going to lose out well if you just do it for commercialization then everybody's going to lose out but if you do it for both I think that's um, no artist gets in this art car and thinks there's not going to be uh, some aspect of commercialization or the change of a market or value. Like everybody knows when you buy a car that there's traffic and you can get in a car accident and it really is your fault. <laughs> if you get in a car accident, you, you complain about, about traffic. So I see every artist that ever gets into the art world is you're already aware that this stuff's going to happen. But you're still doing it anyways. You're still getting into it. You're still, you know, wanting to participate. And uh, and when it comes down to it, I think it's all fun. You know, you can you can own a single piece, or you can own a, a coffee cup. And every person that's going to own their weird little aspect of Banksy's work or whoever's, it they're in they're enjoying it. And we're we're you know talked about that the Banksy's work or any any artist's work is really there to increase the collective dignity of the world. You're, and we can look at beautiful uh, works of art and architecture like Frank Lloyd Wright. None of us own that. Most people don't own the most beautiful aspects of architecture in the world. But when we see them face to face, we feel dignified in the presence. That's where beautiful design and, and beautiful art uh, uh, elevates the the entire planet. And you know, the commercialization, you know, it can seem like a negative, and, and oftentimes it is. But the the aspect is that that like Herring's work on a when I remember a kid seeing um, Herring stuff on a um, uh, when he did the the time trial bike on the disc wheels. And I always loved that. I love the, 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 the idea of art and design, you know, merging in these, these little things. And so when you see Banksy is generally elevating the happiness of most people on the planet. And he uses his language to, to, to elevate the, the social consciousness and the dignity of the entire world. And most artists, I hope, feel the same way about um about their their journey to that and especially designers and architects and people like you the work ethic we're, we're all maintaining or trying to increase the the dignity of our cities and of our of our friendships and stuff and so when you see like this uh the irrational pull to to help out richard's revival or legacy or the, his awareness it's not uh you can't put a dollar sign for me because i i think it's such a fun way and a such of uh not tongue-in-cheek but it's such a fantastic way to to both create awareness and increase the dignity of the the 
the world around it, around the acts of, of doing art. You're always going to have, um, you know, hey, art police, you shouldn't do that. Don't do that. These are the rules. You can't, you have to be here. You can't do this and all that stuff. Like you have to navigate those, those little things and go, I don't care. I'm not asking for your permission. And, and so uh, if you measure it by dignity, you know, um, I think um, the awareness and the, 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 the lines of where commercialization and, and awareness interconnect, um, uh, that's always a good thing for everybody. I don't care if it's on a, on a, on a coffee cup or a, a t-shirt or a, or actual paint on the wall. It's, it's <laughs> everybody's happiness is increased. That's it. It's never gone this way. You know, it's always happiness increased. So good man. The, um, I really appreciate your time. I really appreciate you, yep. um, adding value to the Hamilton market and, uh, sharing, yeah. sharing some of the insight and, and the stories. One last question. Um, when I first come up with my podcast, the birth of it was to inspire a younger demographic. And I came up with uh, a bit of a catchphrase, which goes like this, be happy, never content, be happy, never content. If I were to ask the masked artist who is, uh, painting up America in homage to Richard Hamilton. What does be happy, never content me to you? Uh, I think that equals, that's like a formula for being grateful. Uh, grateful, uh, I mean, grateful is a, is a way of, of um, you choose to be grateful. You can't earn it. You can't buy it on the streets. You can't buy it in a store. You can't even sell it. And uh, I'll go to like a quote from James Stewart on the, um, on a uh, night show, uh, he he's like, I wake up with a pulse. My day is gravy, um, and that's you know I'm not content with just uh just waking up a pulse. I think uh, when you felt like you have some purpose, you know, being happy and having um, the never content part uh, is like earning your next day's happiness. Like you can be happy, but the, the being content, like not content is you're earning tomorrow's happiness. Mm. So uh, I think like this work's never finished and not doing all this, um, like the, the scope of all the, this, how huge this project is, how personal it is and how hard it is to do something like this. Um, it's, it's, it's onto the same ethos. You know, I feel good about last night, but it's, there's still not, there's still pretty shit looking shadow men. You know, it's I've never been content with, with, there's like maybe a couple inches of each one that I thought came out, you know, pretty cool, but uh, it's uh, not happy with them. Never happy with which one, but that little moment of being content with like the last ones that I did in, 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 in New York, uh, I was absolutely, absolutely exhausted and 18 pounds lighter in 20 days. And uh, uh, devoid of all sleep. Um, but I felt like I hope this one little inch of being happy with one of these, these little um, paintings was what Richard felt and was a way of, of transcending the suffering that he felt that we all feel when we're trying to produce something that's, that's awesome. We all have our varying levels of excellence, but the being happy with it is a momentary thing you earn from yesterday's work. And then today's work is not being content until I'm finished with it. And then I'll be happy to look back at it on tomorrow. So I, I agree with it. Sounds good. All right. Well, thank you very much. This is going to be out very, very thank soon. Thank you for your time, man. And uh, everybody who's been enjoying the podcast, please subscribe, comment, share, all the great stuff, and uh, be happy, never get Thank you. Nice one.